Michael, it's time to press the button. We will go on air. So it's been some time, hasn't it, since we've been joined on the screen? Yes, Jed. It's been a while, but I am glad that Jed Power is returning. Well, we had those days of COVID. It must be, what, four years ago, is it now, where I think we semi-revolutionised the island with Derek alongside of us. Have you seen Derek at all? Not, not lately, but that was five years ago. I remember when we first did that in December 2019 and then in January 2020, and you were mocking me. You were <laughs> mocking me, Jed, for saying this COVID thing might be a bit of a problem. And I remember you mocked me for uh, pre-purchasing a whole bunch of uh, stuff to yes. get ahead of uh, the uh, you know panic buying. So have you come to the end of that bottom of pile of pasta that you had? Because you must have had about 100 bags of it. I, I I ate the pasta, Jed. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell us if you've got any good ideas for pasta recipes because I've just run out of all of mine. I just do the same every time. A bit a bit of cream and mushroom and parmesan and garlic. I can't really go any further than that. Perfect. Keep it simple. Well, speaking of uh, keeping things simple, the government ain't doing that, is it? Look at our track record for our health services. I've been zoned in on your Manx taxpayers' Alliance webpage, and uh, you've come up with some uh, really interesting facts for us. Sure. So what it shows is over the last 10 years, the total amount spent on healthcare, so that was previously the Department of Health and Social Care and is now Manx Care, has increased by about 50% over that time. Now, over that period of time, obviously, there's a lot of inflation. Uh, and so when you account for inflation, it's about an 11% increase in spending. And the real thing that real comes home to me is that every single year except one, the Manx Care or its predecessor, the Department of Health and Social Care, overspent its budget. And that shows that there's time and time again, at the start of the financial year, the government says, we're going to spend this much money. And then come the end of the financial year, they found they've spent a whole lot more. But Michael, you know, we, we took a big hit in the pocket of the budget last uh, last year. And it wasn't actually a 2% increase, it was a 10% increase. And that really hit hard, didn't it? Yeah, look, there's a big increase on income tax for, for working families right across the Isle of Man. Uh, and, uh, and what we've seen just this week is that Tinwald were taxing the poor and then acting like they're shocked that it was a bad idea. Uh, absolutely. Um, and this thing just came in under the radar, really. And it goes back to our budgeting system that is allowed uh, in Timwald, where the majority of the MHKs, those outside the inner circle, don't even get a sniff uh, of what's ahead. Yeah, I think it's quite extraordinary that that members of Timwald, they get the budget papers maybe a week or two ahead of the public release, kept under um, close secrecy, uh, and then they are revealed to the public and then voted through the same calendar day. That's just an extraordinary system that is about imposing discipline, not about coming up with the right decisions. So in normal countries, that is countries with functioning and professional parliamentarians, budget budget papers are, are published and then they're analysed and they're quizzed and they're criticised and they are reviewed and they are scrutinised deeply. But here in the Isle of Man, it's uh, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and it's all done. I, I listen to a lot of the radio broadcasts from the chamber and certainly at the budget, June Watterson, he, he was, you know, demonstrating how frustrated he was with the process. But I understand that Claire Christian, I, I think she's uh, taken it on board and there's some moves to make some changes about how the budget is delivered. But when you listen to that budget debate where you have these 24 MHKs all just having a few minutes standing up and trying to justify their existence, but not actually doing anything and generally voting for something that they've said they don't agree with. Yeah, it's most, it's most extraordinary. And, you know, frankly, it's quite, must be quite humiliating for many of those MHKs to have such little self-regard to be, you know, being out there, they whinge and they whine and they moan and they speak this hot air. But when it comes to the fact of the matter, the vast majority of them, in fact, almost all of them, voted through. It's just must be the most self defacing experience for so many of these MHKs where we see them speak words one way but then they act and vote the other way just just must be so humiliating for so many of them well this this structure obviously isn't working and with this massive amount of money and you're talking millions and millions and millions going into health 
have we got any evidence that service delivery has improved? Well, what we see is there's more cash going in every year, uh, but the same amount of chaos. Uh, you know, and the the you know the classic government maths is that the budget is up, but the results are the same. It's true. It's true. And the, the Isle of Man, unfortunately, just seems to be teetering at the moment. And, and certainly health. Anyone thinking of coming to move to the island, you know, come here to raise a family uh, and, you know, embark on a new career, buy a house and what have you. One of the first things going to be look at, looking at is healthcare, isn't it? Yeah, look, and I think there's a real opportunity to make the Isle of Man a centre for excellence and to do good things for healthcare. Uh, but really, you know, we seem to be funding inefficiency. We're not funding healthcare. Uh, and so, you know, what we see is this year's X many million dollars over, X million, many million pounds over budget. Last year, another 10 or 20 million. The previous year, another 10 million. Uh, and so in the last 10 years, they go over budget every year except one, which ironically was the COVID year. Uh, and that's because I think that the, there are a whole lot of important medical procedures that were delayed by the closure. And so I guess the Manx Care somehow saved money on that year. Well, I know for a fact that there are some good news stories that do come out of the hospital. I know that from people that I bump into and see and that the treatment that they've had and the the service from the staff who, you know, respect who they're dealing with and give it 100%. And I know that. And I just wish we could hear more about that. But I would love to hear some of our MHKs to actually applaud and come out with real evidence that there are improvements being made and that there is a future. But I don't even see that. Yeah, you're right, Jed, uh, in that one of the the things that uh, in this comparison of healthcare spending, we need to recognise that over the last 10 or 12 years or so, um, there have been some reorganisations. And one reorganisation was the Department of Public Health or the Directorate of Public Health being moved out of health and social care uh, and into the cabinet office. And one would expect, therefore, there would be more or better or improved data reporting on what is causing people to die in the Isle of Man. But unfortunately, we don't see that. Uh, and it's been very disappointing to see relatively little uh, and very poor and very late data on such things. Now, we've just got a new director of public health and a sidekick as well. And so maybe there is a possibility of some improvement and reform because it seems to me that for many years that whole department of public health is more concerned with you know this nannying of people's health rather than actually you know improving people in the long term. Well, Laurie Hooper, the former minister, in next week's Timwald, he's uh, posing the question about that two percent uh, tax increase, that that extra that everyone had to be uh, paying out of the wages. Uh, that's to be. Uh, taken away and it's going to go back to 20%. It'll be a real test for the government on how they deal with that. Yeah, well, Alex Allenson promised that it was going to be temporary. So, you know, unfortunately, it seems that in Alex Allenson's world, nothing is quite as temporary as a, or nothing is quite as permanent as a temporary tax rise. Well, you know, if he sees something, he wants to tax it. Mm -hmm. if, he, if he sees something moving, he, he wants to uh, regulate it. And then if it stops moving, he wants to subsidise it. Well, we've got Claire Christian at the reins, and she's been a very strong personality uh, in politics and speaks out and speaks very well. And I'd say as part of this, uh, the, the band of MHKs who were almost like an opposition party. But now, is she going to be compromised with the views and the views where she uh, you know, didn't strike a vote for the, uh, that was in confidence of the chief minister? It must be quite a, a difficult situation there. You know, look, I'm not really worried about her personality, but we will see what happens when when she comes and gets put to the test with substance. And so on substance, Claire Christian stands alone as one of the few members of the House of Keys who have repeatedly voted against bad budgets. And so she should be congratulated on that, in that when I was talking before about some MHKs say one thing and vote the other way, Claire Christian is someone who, so far in this term, uh, has been consistent with her votes and with her words. And so that puts her in a class above most of the MA other MHKs. There's a few others, but she certainly seems to be one of the most intellectually rigorous uh, and impressive people. And I think what sets her apart, especially from some of the other uh, MHKs, is that she's led teams. She's led businesses uh, and she's helped to develop something in the Isle of Man where she's had her own skin in the game. And that's a real significant difference from a number of the other MHKs who are junior government bureaucrats 
or you know administrators and and in that sense her ability to create jobs and to put her own skin in the game uh, really sets her apart from the rest uh, john wannenberg of course is another one um, laurie hooper ran you know perhaps not a small business but he was you know certainly a professional leader of, a, of his uh, accounting firm uh, jane paul wilson is another one uh, and so there are a few mhks who do have some degree of experience leading teams claire christian you know we'll now see how that goes as, as health minister well the, these people you know they are intelligent and they do get it and the electorate must be hounding them about all kinds of things you know you mentioned about you know we're getting charged left right and center we've got the most expensive motoring probably in europe and it seems that now um it wouldn't be good for everyone to be uh, taking bike rides and buses because of the amount of cash the exchequer would lose out on for fuel and excise duty and and all the rest of it um it's almost like the government is clambering for cash yeah well we saw this week just gone that uh, the Isle of Man government passed this new global minimum corporation tax compliant regime, the, the second pillar of, of that, which will effectively impose a minimum tax of 15% on the large, the very large corporations. So those are turnover of over 750 million euros a year. Uh, and so that will raise about 37 million pounds or so, give or take a little bit uh, over the next little bit. Uh, and what was really disappointing was just to see the, you know, the media interview of Alex Allenson with Manx Radio, where he just seems to gobble it up. He, he again, wants to, you know, this guy has never seen a tax he does not like. He, you know, he's, he's, he is the, the other man's number one tax tax lover. And so after his stature as the, uh, probably the worst education minister we've seen in a long time, he's now working his way into being the worst treasury minister we've seen in a very long time because he instantly wants to jack this into spending. And it's really quite extraordinary that 10 months ago, he came to Tinwald saying, we need X many million pounds for education, X million pounds for health and so on and so forth. And now he's happy to junk, junk that up because he's got a new pot of money. Uh, and so I would not want to be a person who stands between Alex Allenson and a kip pocket of someone in the Isle of Man, because this man just wants to gobble it all up. Well, at the moment, there's not been a huge amount of new fun things happening uh, on the island. I mean, even the likes of, say, Castle Russian High School, which has been in planning now for years and years and years, over a decade. Is that ever going to be built? I think they're looking at 2029 at the earliest, you know, something like that would be finished, which is... Good luck. Yeah, Dark Road School here in Douglas is exactly the same. It's oh. been, you know, it's just just the delay and obfuscation. Uh, and uh, it is extraordinary. We've seen Summerland. Uh, we've seen all these disused eyesores across Douglas that are really just being left to ruin. And there's a real opportunity, I think, just to get out of the way. A lot of these sites do not require government spending because there is a huge thirst and demand for housing. People would happily buy and pay for their own homes if they were allowed to have them provided and built. Well, you, you've hit the nail on the head. Park Road, Victoria Road and Summerland. Uh, and I think the home field site off uh, Woodburn Road. And you could probably, I don't know, what's that? Three, 300 houses? I don't know. That, that, that's 300 families liberated. But who's pulling the strings here? Why, why wouldn't they do that? What is plainly obvious to serve the Manx public? Who is pulling the strings? Is it the building companies? Do, do they not want them to, to, to build houses in those areas because perhaps it's a little bit too much of a challenge rather than the greenfield site? Is it the, uh, you know, the, the rental cartel that are in the back of this that they don't want new houses to be built? It's an absolute mystery. Yeah, well, look, we have our, of course, like every community has, we have the NIMBYs, the not in my backyards. But what seems to be a particularly and peculiarly Manx development is that there are some people who are now moving from NIMBYs, which is not in my backyard, uh, but rather there's a group who seem to be bananas, and that is build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything else. Uh, and so that is just extraordinary. Uh, and so we should have inner urban sites which are ripe for development when we have Manx families crying out for homes and housing. We should allow people 
to provide homes for humans. You're, you're absolutely right, and it is sad. It is sad because you know we, we need to look to a future because society will erode. People won't stay here. They won't live here. They'll look to move in. You know, you, you hear conversations, people moving to Northern Ireland because, you know, housing is much less expensive and there's more opportunities and more going on. You know, that, that is that is really sad. I mean, in your locality, say, what's happening uh, on the quay there, the, uh, the nuisance building? I know that's, uh, you know, in your line of sight, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a real shame. The nuisance building, obviously, I, I formerly did some work for, for the proposed developers, uh, but uh, it is really sad in that what should be a beacon of opportunity and development and excitement and interest is instead a, a crumbling and dangerous site. Uh, it's really quite extraordinary because the engineers made very clear that they would not want to work in it because the site, the current building, is has gone too far and that there should have been 30 or 40 years ago, back in the 1980s or 1990s, a conversation about if this is an important building that we want to save, then we've got to save it then. But now here we are, deep into the 21st century, the building is literally crumbling, uh, and it's really quite in an extraordinary state. I would not want to be in that building working, let me give you the hot tip, uh, because at any moment the walls could collapse. Uh, and so therefore, you know, the, the obvious thing to do was to knock it down and build something that was sensitive, that was environmentally sustainable and economically sustainable as well. That really was an opportunity. But, you know, the, these fake experts in the government said, no, we need to preserve this crumbling it's eyesore. It's absolutely meaningless. You know, there's, there's no historical significance to be aware of, to really note, okay. It's not, it's not important. It's like the, uh, the stables up on the promenade, same thing. You know, these things should be dropped. Or it's like, say... Castletown Golf Links, you know, which is an aberration, area of special scientific interest. It's a nature reserve. Does that complement our biosphere? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't at all. And it should just be flattened. That, that is it. So, Michael, there are uh, some challenges ahead for the government. If you were pulling the strings, what would you do regarding health? Well, I think you've got to, fundamentally, you need to ensure that the people who are providing the services are held accountable. And from that, everything flows from that, in that you need to ensure that good performers are awarded and bad performers are held accountable. And, you know, that, that area, the, the, the health services had some negativity, some bad stories. Of course, the ransom case, I think, um, really took the island by storm and not just resulted in a payout of uh, three million, but I think it was beyond that, wasn't it? The, the legal costs and I think all the, the golden handshakes, uh, you know, will have gone way into six, seven million. Um, but certainly people just disappear into the sunset, don't they? Yeah, exactly. We need accountability. And I think one form of really useful accountability is some of these tin wall committees and investigations. There's a real potential there uh, to investigate and to hold the perpetrators accountable. Well, there is a lot going on in Timwald House of Keys, and if you go to the Hansard site, it is so difficult to actually keep on top of things. It, it really is a full-time job to do that. I mean, I'm lucky say that on Tuesdays I can tune in and listen to the debates in progress. But You say you're lucky? Oh, that sounds like a terrible way to spend a Tuesday, mate. <laughs> <It's so laughs> that be lucky? Good. I'd like to hear what's an unlucky day for you, Jed. But the, you know, these things are booted into the long grass. And unless you're really on it and really listening for it, because I'm not really sure that our media, you know, really pay it very, very close attention. And we just see these things just skate by and drift away and we all pay the, you know, the consequences, so to speak. But really, what I'd like to see, say, for a, a new health minister is almost like a pledge to say, I'm going to lift up every stone that needs to be lifted. And I'm going to look, and I'm going to challenge, but I'm also going to let you, the public, know about it. That's what I'd like to see. You know, some, some actual honesty, because these people just disappear. Yeah, I think you're right, Jed, in that the first job of every minister is to recognise that they are the public's representative to the government, not the government's representative to the public. Uh, and so hopefully the new minister and Claire Christian will honour and, and do that. I have high hopes 
you know, she's previously run small businesses. She's previously um, had skin in the game. And I think that is really important uh, and an important principle. And, you know, I wish her every well, very well. Formidable. Formidable is the word. So, you know, we, I think we've just got to watch this space and, and hopefully, you know, she, she can deliver because it must be a real, what can I say, a real mess in there somewhere. You know, for someone just to walk in fresh and go, right, where, what are all these managers doing? Because it's all documented in the background, isn't it? You know, these exorbitant wages, fantastic rock star salaries. And yet what is coming out at the end of the pipeline? Yeah, that's a good question, Jed. And one of the things that I think has been really impressive uh, is this Economic Review Policy Committee or Economic Policy Review Committee, uh, which Claire Christian has been a key part of. Uh, and their findings, looking at the government's broader economic strategy, have been really interesting. You know, some of it, you know, this idea, and, you know, if I can read from the, the Manx Radio reporting, uh, saying that they had three key recommendations. Firstly, that tax incentives for, for people to move to and stay in the island should be extended to the working population and single people. And I think that's bang on. You know, if you have a society, if we have a community here in the Isle of Man that is good for working people, it's good for single people, it's good for couples, it's good for families, then people from elsewhere may want to come and join us. Uh, and that if you just get the fundamentals right, that in itself will be the best way to you know, have a better future. Secondly, that as part of the f preparation for future budget debates, and again, I'm quoting from Max Radio here, mm -hmm. Tinwood should be provided with comprehensive analysis, analysis of the impact of budget proposals on net, net incomes for all family types. And I think that's that's bang on, spot on. Uh, it's possible to do some of those calculations yourself as a, as a lay person and, and you know members of Tinwood have very little administrative support if they're not ministers uh, but yeah certainly that is something that should be doable um, and thirdly that treasury should devise a strategy in time for the next budget to address personal allowances and i think that's that's the perhaps the most important one that is the one that offers the opportunity to ease the squeeze on taxpayers lives uh, because unfortunately, and, and again, you know, to salute Claire Christian on that, she was the only person to vote against the 2023 doubling of tax on people on the lowest earning workers in our community. So back in 2023, and I, I want to be very clear here, in 2024, which we know about, the government increased the headline tax rate of taxation from 20% to 22%, which is a big increase uh, in, in that tax rate. But the previous year, by keeping the personal allowances at the same low level, it meant that as a result of inflation, the lowest paid workers in our community had the biggest relative increases in their taxation. So for someone who was earning a living wage back in 2023, they would have paid double the income tax. Claire Christian stood alone in voting against that increase. She should be commended for that. And I think that that shows that there's perhaps the possibility uh, of some significant improvements and reforms at health because, you know, so far, Claire Christian has been not just saying, but doing the right thing. Well, so many are just rolling over, aren't they? And, and allowing this to happen. And really, those people on the low incomes who've got increased taxes, but, you know, the cost of living when you're, you're just going to buy your, your, your essentials, your food, you know, you, you've got to run a vehicle. There's very little left at, at the end. And we're going to be paying the price because disposable income. That, that's the lifeblood of where we live, isn't it? You know, we, we want to go to places that uh, provide, you know, good food, cafes, you know, pubs, bars, things like that. And if there's, say, a reduction in 20% of their income and their staff aren't happy, you know, they're not earning, it's a vicious circle. And eventually the lights will just go out in town. Yeah, exactly right. And I think there, there is opportunity because I think there is an opportunity for the Isle of Man to be better in the future as a result of improving productivity. And so that would require significant reform. It would require uh, dealing with this maze of bureaucracy and red tape. But I think there's an opportunity to allow people to invest in development, uh, invest in growth and invest in productivity, which I think is ultimately the, the way to, for people to be richer, wealthier and happier in, in every facet of their life, not just economically, but also in terms of spiritually and emotionally and so on. But we, we're in the position on the Isle of Man where we could manage it, isn't it? The, the economy is so small. You can manage the money, can't you, that's, that's floating around. 
And I think by, you know, re relaxing, uh, you know, the, the pressures that businesses are under, um, certainly, you know, rates is, is a big one, isn't it? Is an absolute big one. You know, let's look at where, where the rates are spent. Are the, are the rates wasted, say, in Douglas Council? You know, that, that, that's, that's a big one, really. And if we don't tackle these problems, it, it's just going to get beyond the point of no return. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, I think that the, that the rates and the taxation is part of it, but also there is this broader realm of red tape. Uh, one of the things I thought was really good is that Claire Barber has shelved this policy whereby she wanted to previously uh, introduce all these new rules and regulations and ranking systems around hygiene, uh, which would have unnecessarily penalised people, in that the solution for a crappy meal is, you know, write an angry, angry review on Facebook or on Google or whatever it is, right? You know, the public are very well aware in the Isle of Man of those places that are good and those places that are bad. We do not need these government bureaucrats to you know, get in fiddling in there and to choose on our behalf. Because when the bureaucrats and politicians choose, the people of the Isle of Man lose. Absolutely. And it just went to extreme. I was laughing uh, or crying maybe about, remember the data protection issue with the, the doorbells with a, a video camera in, you know, that we're all going to have to pay if you've got one of these fancy doorbells. You know, with the... Uh, the, the no, we were never going to have to pay. The The rules were, if you if you... If your doorbell video has a meaningful or a material capturing of the public space, i.e. off your property, then you might have to if you're more than just a personal individual. So I, I you know, I think we got to limit our concern about such things. Yeah, but if you were say a uh, say for instance a taxi driver and you want a camera to protect yourself and protect your passengers. You know, for obvious reasons, late night and drunkenness and things like that, the obvious things, you, you've got to pay a, a, a yearly registration for that to protect yourself. Yeah, it costs 50 quid. It's, you know, for every, every, businesses have to do that. Yeah, that's, a, you know, that's unfortunate, but that's, that's, that, that's different from having a, a video doorbell. Well, I, uh, I, I'll have to look again at the video doorbell. Um, Go, go ahead. Yeah. My, my my understanding was that if you're projecting out onto the street, you're going to get hit. Yeah, like well, come on, dude. Like the <laughs> like the information commissioner doesn't have time dealing with all the other more important stuff that Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Yeah. That's not. But anyway, that's not, it, it, it captured you know, a headline, oh. and it took a lot of time, and uh, I think it was raised in Timwald, wasn't it? I think David Ashford uh, or in House of Keys. I think he, he brought that, so we'll, we'll have to look for the answer that was given sure. to well, him. I would, you know, just 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 remember that you know these some of these uh, copy and paste uh, media outlets uh, are more interested in disinformation than actually helping educate people, uh, and so you know this talk about doorbells is a bit overblown. Yeah, I think I think really we're just uh, looking at red tape and bureaucracy, and perhaps um, we're over egging. The, uh, the the situation at times. So we'll just go back into uh, planning. You know that we spoke to uh, spoke about before, and especially what happened uh, there on the quay. What what do you think was the real source of the problem there? Why? How come there was no resolution there? Well, there was a resolution. The resolution was that the government forbade the demolition of the what used to be called that nuisance property down on the quay. Uh, and that was because the government, in their very finite and limited wisdom, uh, determined that this was a property worth protecting. I think they're wrong on the merits. Yeah. And and fundamentally, the people of the Isle of Man know that, that this is what the government decided. And, you know, ultimately, they're democratically ac accountable and electable, elected people. And that's what you get. We're getting what we voted for. We, we're getting, you know, these, you know, middling mediocre municipal menaces uh, and uh, and that's what we're getting absolutely marvelous alliteration there. <laughs> but uh, i think how can you get around it that this is this is the issue you know is, is there a way to challenge it the property owner you know, the, the know? fact of the matter is jed the elections matter you know i ran <laughs> i had a crack at it i ran i lost and i got over it so you know so be it so so in that sense you know i think that you just need to recognize that Unfortunately, the 
current legacy politicians have this system of spreading accountability so thinly that no one wears it at all. And so what we just need to do is, you know, at that next election, we should vote out the bad legacy politicians who say no to everything because they're fearful of, you know, some crank with a Facebook account. I think really uh, the next election, who knows is going to put their, uh, their name up. It could be crisis time, you know, by the by the time that comes along in a, in a is it two years, isn't it? Um, you know, the, the economy could be in further disarray. Who knows what's going to happen to the employment situation on the island? So it's going to be really tough for someone to put their, you know, hat in the ring, so to speak. And I do, I do wonder what calibre of, um, you know, candidates. I think, that's, I think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. You know, there's so many people right across our community who are, you know, community leaders and now have an opportunity to step up and, and to do that sort of thing. Won't be me, but good luck to whoever they are. Well, it's some significant sacrifice if you're in business, isn't it? If you're, you know, if you've got a good career going to actually forgo that and and put yourself in the chamber and have a huge uphill struggle. I mean, would you say it's time for party politics? Look, I, I, look, I, I think that's a bit of a distraction you know, in that in that ultimately what we need to do is we need to identify people who make bad decisions and kick them out. And we need to reward people who do good decisions by putting them in. <laughs> and that's that's what it comes mm -hmm. down to. You know, and, you know, as of course, I would prefer if people uh, were joined institutions and joined teams, whether it be you know, political organisations or other organisations, because I think that allows people to be held accountable for the decisions that their team made. And so what we see in the UK is that people did not like the previous mob who were in party, so they voted for the other one, sacked them and, and replaced them. Uh, and that democracy is ultimately a really wonderful error correction system in that when you have crappy politicians, you sack them uh, and you replace them and you can improve them. And then if the new mob are good, you keep them in office. And if the new mob are no good, you sack them again. And do you keep sacking them until you get good people? Well, we've got to find people who have got the skill to create freedom. Freedom in government, freedom to move, uh, unlock all these restraints because the, the Isle of Man is is wedged, isn't it? It's wedged. There's, there's very little happening. Uh, in, in this... Um, administration we might get a sewage plant in laxi i think that that's going that's going to be a lot there's going to be nothing yeah, well, I think you're right there and i think true leadership is not just choosing from option a b or c that the civil servants give to you but rather setting a menu and a proactive policy of reform uh, and there's a real opportunity to do that uh, unfortunately we have some pretty miserable MHKs. We have some mediocre MHKs and we have some good ones. Uh, and so what's really important is we differentiate between those three different groups uh, and we uh, you know, look for the future. Well, Michael, it's been a, a pleasure again. That was uh, part two of our uh, little uh, discussion there. So we'll reunite next week where you could be from a surprise location, which we will uh, reveal in seven days' time, hopefully. Excellent. I'll chat to you then, Jed.